tickets. And while you are texting in uh, for that, I will introduce our guest who's joining us here on Good Things. You can take your browser over to supertalktv.com. You'll see I'm not alone. I have Dr. Furlow here, Dr. Christopher Furlow. He's the director of Autism Solutions for Canopy uh, Solutions. And I think this is a great topic to have, particularly in April, because it is Autism Awareness Month, correct? That's so right. welcome. And you had you have already done your due diligence with Paw Patrol, so you're not trying to win tickets today. <laughs> That's absolutely right. <laughs> I feel like yep. every parent, either when you hear that, you either go, oh, I'm not in that phase anymore, or you're like, ah, my kid would absolutely adore going to that. So, um, so yeah, good stuff there. Okay, let's talk about April being Autism Awareness Month. For you guys there at Canopy Solutions, what does that give you an opportunity to do in terms of autism awareness? Well, I think um, it's, it's really about engaging uh, the autistic community. Um, and our families, um, talking a little bit more about what that means to them. Um, and then also just really bringing about like a lot of our, you know, our expertise conversations about, you know, what the signs are, um, how to go about getting a diagnosis, um, treatment options and all that other good stuff. And it's just a really good opportunity to just have those conversations. And to, to raise awareness to the rest of us who are, are increasingly finding our children in classrooms, at church, or within our communities, and how we can make make it more comfortable. Um, it can be integrated better for a better experience for everybody. I'm always excited to hear ways that, because you know, you don't know what you don't know. And then sometimes it can be awkward just because you simply don't know, know you know um, how to approach things so I always enjoy reminding everybody that you know um, how we can make our autistic neighbors feel included and right. part of everyday life because you mentioned your um, autistic families D- do you know any statistics or maybe numbers here in Mississippi of children or adults who who are living with autism um, well, so, I mean, I, I would assume that it's probably not much different than that, the national um, statistics, yeah. so the 1 in 44 um, being the big number. Um, but, you know, there there are likely a lot of folks here in our state that are, unfortunately, they just don't have a whole lot of access to care um, or access to diagnostics and, and things like that. So it may, it, you know, it may be larger um, than that number. It may, it may not be, but... So when yeah. you mention that, Dr. Furlow, because sometimes people will say like certain certain things like autism is on the rise. And mm-hmm. is it that it's on the rise or is it more that because we've got more access to care, care is, access to care is getting better every year, more diagnostic tools, just more information that we're able to help more individuals that maybe have always slipped through the cracks? Or is it a combination of both? I suspect that it's probably a little bit of a combination of both, um, you know, not not too terribly long ago, they they kind of like remapped what it what an autism spectrum disorder was. So things like Asperger's syndrome, PDD, NOS, or pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified. So that's a long <laughs> long name of it. That is a um, clinical term for everything. <laughs> Acronym um, for everything as well. Yeah. So um, those sorts of things were kind of all lumped into autism spectrum disorder, um, and so that that changed um, many years ago. Um, with the new diagnostic manual uh, that came out. But it's also likely, you know, in terms of um, engaging our communities, increasing, you know, um, education on on what autism is and what, you know, some of those signs. Um, I suspect that, you know, trying to get out into some of those other communities that wouldn't have have otherwise known that, um, trying to get them in for, for, um, you know, medical care, diagnostics, and and things like that could have contributed. you know, I, and then I also see some other information where it's kind of like, well, this has probably always been, you know, what it is. We just, like you just said, like we just haven't really caught it. Um, right. So. And I guess it, when you think about, um, because now I think in Mississippi, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, and there are so many more screening opportunities or screening tools or protocols, even just from, we were just discussing our children, Dr. Furlow, I have an almost 10-year-old and almost 3-year-old, so there's seven-year difference, and the difference in the what tools and practices pediatricians have or within just the hospital setting from having the baby, you know, change drastically, right? And I feel like with the 3-year-old, there have been more questions, more screenings uh, for a lot of different things, but particularly questions 
science around um, the aut- autism spectrum. You're shaking your head. Am I right with yes, that? Like, yeah. am I not, or am I just more in tune with it? You know, because no. of conversations like we're having today here on Good Things. You're abs- Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, so I know. Um, so prior to being in Mississippi, I was in Maryland, and one of the things that our pediatrician did. Um, for for my two children was was go through the ages and stages questionnaire. Um, if there were any concerns, there was there was what's called the M chat, which is a checklist um, for autism and toddlers. Um, there's autism interviews and all kinds of other things that they really try to hone in on to you know some of those red flags that we've been hearing about. I think in years past, um, and and try and do their best to catch it early and then submit the the appropriate referral for for a do- like a more formal diagnostic assessment. Um, you know, so they're they're definitely catching it. When it comes to a diagnosis, I mean, I know that could be a, a tricky uh, question. I mean, is it just objective based or is there ways now to really have a diagnosis? I mean, it's a little bit different than, you know, you have hypertension. There are numbers that tell you that, right? Versus a spectrum or, um, I know that was a tough question. <laughs> no, that's, yeah, that's right. Um, well, so one of the, one of the like golden standards for autism assessments is known as the ADOS. Um, it's the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. Um, and it's it's uh, based off of, like the name would imply, a lot of direct observations looking for those hallmarks of what an autism spectrum disorder, you know, may present as. And there's different, um, you know, age ranges. So there's there's some for toddlers, there's some for older um, older children, adolescents, um, and kind of beyond that. So um, so yeah, they they spend a lot of time trying to look at things um, that would indicate the presence of an autism uh, spectrum disorder. That just goes to why it's so important to stick with those well baby visits and all of those type of things throughout the early stages because you know after a while you just get tired seeing your pediatrician <laughs> even if they're not sick <laughs> but but you realize when you go that there there can be important things that can be caught if you you know by by attending those um, those visits yeah and that's absolutely right and so for for any parent out there you know when in within that first year of your child's life I mean those frequents are quite visit right or quite frequently um, you know scheduled and then beyond that then it kind of you go from like the year checkup to like an 18 month checkup to two year checkup and then it just starts getting longer and longer um, and so those opportunities to have those discussions with your you know your pediatrician become a little bit fewer unless you have you know, some some serious concerns that you you may have not otherwise discussed. When where does Canopy come in for autism? Um, so we have two early intervention clinics here in the Jackson area, um, and and for children and families that are seeking an admission into our program, um, you must have an autism diagnosis uh, from the get go. Um, unfortunately, we do not provide those diagnostic services just yet, um, but we're we're firmly planted in the early intervention space. Um, so we, we work with children two to seven um, predominantly. And, um, you know, we try, to, we, we try to do our best to, um, you know, take a full comprehensive approach to whatever it is that would help that family and that child um, achieve the highest quality of life uh, that they can. And um, a lot of times that's, that's language development and language intervention. It could be behavior intervention, feeding intervention. Um, really just in toilet training, like all that stuff that you would need to, to prepare for, for school and things like that. Um, and so really, you know, we take, we take that full comprehensive approach and really um, put a lot of our resources and expertise behind that, um, you know, tr- just trying to help in any way possible. I think that's one of the biggest struggles when it comes to uh, anything with the spectrum is the fact that, well, and that's with everything, there's no one size fits all. And right. so it's easy to say what works for one family, that's not going to necessarily work for the other. And that's can also be why it can feel like breakthroughs are slow to come because it's harder to sort of nail it down. And you can't just take a pill for it like you can <laughs> your hypertension. Um, but you can stick with us. We've got more with Dr. Furlow coming up next. But we are, I would say, kicking off April, but Dr. Furlow, April's like halfway <laughs> over. I just feel like sure it's is. all moving so fast. Um, but he's the director of Autism Solutions for Canopy Children's uh, Solution of Mississippi. And um, it, it's Autism Awareness Month. So I know it's a busy month for, for you guys. And I think it's always a good conversation just to have as a mom who's got uh, two kids and two different sort of age groups. We're coming across more families who, you know, have children with autism and trying to make people feel included and all the things that, you know, go with that. So when you are working with those that maybe 
uh, don't understand autism fully and are trying to integrate, to be integrated with everyone else. What are some good tips or recommendations or, I mean, I don't know the right language to say, but it's like, you know, help us make it all go smooth or err. Yeah. Well, so um, one of the things that I think uh, that, you know, we always kind of talk about um, as a team in our clinic is just really just trying to focus on just having a really positive interaction. Um, and that can go, you can accomplish that in a couple ways. Um, you can really just not try and direct anything, just kind of let that that individual kind of like lead, lead the interaction, lead the activity, um, whatever it is uh, that you're doing, you just want to try and be a part of it. Um, and, and one or a couple ways that you can do that um, is kind of just describing what it is that they're doing. Um, you could, you know, imitation is kind of like the sincere, most sincere form of flattery, right? So you can try and like grab a couple toys, imitate what it is that they're playing with or imitate what it is that they're doing. Um, if they're they're trying to engage with you and talk with you, you can reflect back what, what it is that they're saying, just, you know, to acknowledge that they're being heard and, and things like that. Um, and then the other thing that we really harp on is uh, this um, this behavior specific praise that we that we talk about all the time. So specifically like labeling what it is that they're doing so well, the things that they're doing um, that's that's so good um, and, and praising them for that, no matter how small. Um, just And those are just real, just basic strategies for trying to have as positive an interaction as you possibly can. Works in your marriage, so, too. You just praise, praise, praise. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the that's smallest right. things. But, you know, I mean, I think what I'm hearing from you, Dr. Verla, though, is children with aut- autism or autistic children um, are not much different than our own when it comes to wanting to feel included that's and right. be told, be, you know, positive reinforcement works for everybody. Mm-hmm. And that sometimes I feel like we overthink it. We, you yeah. know, we make it harder than it has to be for everyone to play on the playground together or for everyone to go to vacation Bible school together or it, it doesn't have to be as complicated as our, our brains like to make it that yeah that's absolutely I wholeheartedly agree um, you know that you know one of the things I think that that might get lost is that like just just like everyone else in the world like you know autistic Children, autistic individuals, they have their own strengths, weaknesses, their own likes, dislikes, and things like that. So really just trying to um, get in tune with, you know, what it is that, they, that they're interested in and just really just trying to be a part of it um, and really letting, having them let you come in um, is, is really the approach that we like to take. I also think it's a good thing to talk about, like, myths around uh, certain um, disorders, autism being one of them, because I feel like you hear a lot in the media or it's a lot of hearsay. And when you have something like a spectrum, you know, it's hard to have any concrete whatever to go off of. But you guys there, what is just when you hear something or you um, get the feeling that someone's assuming something about an individual with autism, what makes your little hairs stand up and be like, (laughs) ah! (laughs) <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, one of the things I think that, I, that I've that i heard in, in my experience is just, you know, they're going to have these, like, special talents and, and, and things like that. And, and like I was just saying a second ago, I mean, everybody has their own set of special talents, right, their own interests and things like that. And for some um, indiv- individuals with autism um, spectrum uh, disorders, they have some intense interests, right? And so some of those strengths um, could kind of fall in line with those interests. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean like that's going to be like everybody, everybody. And that's not going to be like, you know, their career or anything like, you know what I mean? Um, so, if, so for example, y'all, y'all were talking about bass guitar and piano and stuff like that earlier, um, when I was hanging out in the green room and, um, you know, I, I was intensely interested in, in, in the guitar when I was, when I was a teenager, it doesn't mean I'm going to be a rock star or, or get a record deal either, you know? So, um, you know, they may be interested in cars and, and, and things like that, and that may grow to, you know, a profession or, or, or whatever, but um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're they're going to be, you know, um, you know, that's the direction that they're going to take. Winning uh, America's Got Talent. That's right. <laughs> I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he was phenomenal. But, he, you know, he was phenomenal because he was one in a million. I mm-hmm. mean, his, his talent, out you know, outpaced anybody's in terms of singing and, and the piano. Yeah. Um, the other one, too, that I think that um, that, you know, I, I kind of I relate to the families um, that kind of experience this like very early on, like right after a diagnosis is provided. You know, I think that one of the big things that everybody really gets concerned about is are we going to ever 
develop vocal communication or you know a lot of a lot of kids with autism are predominantly like maybe nonverbal or something like that and that's just not always the case and that's why I think early intervention matters so much um, trying to get them access to that care that we were talking about um, just a few minutes ago um, so that you can begin working on those things and and really um, nonverbal you know talking producing vocal communication and things like that yeah I mean that's that's obviously you know a big thing um, but from from our clinic's perspective and, and what our clinicians try to accomplish is just really establishing a means um, for them to have their needs met some form of communication no matter what it actually looks like so it could be pictures or uh, you know voice output you know device or something like that like the important thing is, is that they're learning the behavior of communicating um, with another person so it seems like too, Dr. Furlow, you're you're bringing home the point that there's hope no matter what or where you fall on the spectrum, and it's that early intervention that matters most, and taking it seriously and getting connected, and then you know, riding the journey or you know the wave of the journey because it'll look different for every family, and that has to be frustrating, right? Like that it's so individualized, but it has to I mean there's no other way. Yeah, and and that's so true, and really. Um you know, part of that journey, I think, for most of our families, um, and for us too, in our <laughs> in our clinic families, um, or, or a clinical family, um, you know, we we kind of ride that journey too, um, because you know, we show up to work every day, really just trying to figure out every little nuance that's going to get them a step closer, no matter how small that victory is. Um, you know, we. We want to try and inch ever so closer to that family's goal um, and, and uh, take that approach um, step by step, um, no matter what it is. And so it is it is extremely individualized. Um, so one family's experience may not be another family's experience. And, you know, some families um, may be waiting a really long time before communication occurs or maybe they're, um, you know, they feel comfortable going out into the community and, and, and being around other people if there's tantrums and behavior problems and things like that. So um, we're very mindful of all that. And we should be mindful not to judge one autistic person against another one because it's a spectrum disorder for a reason, right? To have compassion and empathy for families that are walking through this. And if someone's listening and maybe they haven't heard of Canopy uh, before and they've got a child or a grandchild or something between the ages of two to seven, two to seven, how do they get in touch with you, Dr. Furlow, or can they? Yeah. Uh, yeah so or you guys, <laughs> no, you specifically. Ask for Dr. Furlow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you, yeah, you can call um, our uh, actually autism business uh, manager. Her name is Shelby Stevenson. Um, her number is 769 seven 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 one one zero zero um, and you can just get in touch with her um, like a lot of uh, clinics we ask for a lot of information and, and we go through um, a process for trying to uh, determine the appropriateness of fit for our program and you know we want to be successful in everything for um, or successful as we can be for you and your family so um, get in touch with Shelby and she'll she'll set you up how did you find yourself in this field dr. Furlow um, ooh, that's a long story. I don't you know. Got about can, a minute. Uh, okay. Well, so <laughs> like a lot of people, I you know I was touched by um, someone with autism. Um, it turned out to be my cousin, um, and I was at, so I was actually a biology major. <laughs> I thought I wanted to be a pediatrician, and then um, the more and more I kind of dug into it, the more I realized like uh, just um, how many folks out there need help. And um, I moved all the way out to Southern California uh, to learn what I could learn um, because educational opportunities at that time were kind of limited. Um, but yeah, for me, it was my it was my cousin, um, so a family member. Well, it doesn't have to take a family member for us to have compassion and want to learn more about something that's starting that's affecting our neighbors all around us. So I appreciate your time. And Thanks kudos to, um, I guess, <laughs> April. You know, be, we'll see you next April <laughs> or sure. maybe before. Uh, but you guys stick with us. we got more for you coming up next. Um.